Andrew, can you see the image and hear me okay? Yep, you're good to go. Great. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, tonight will be a little bit quicker because we're not reviewing student artwork and we're doing a kind of a simpler sketch because Taliesin and West, our subject for today is kind of difficult to think of it as a singular building. It's much more of a flowing campus. It's It was really designed to be kind of just a seasonal building originally. And eventually the whole movement down to Scottsdale flip-flopped as the firm had more of a presence and wanted to work down there year round and less in spring green. So it became more art architecture and air conditioned space as time went on. But in the, in the beginning, it was really more of a tent, kind of a camp surrounding in the 1930s. Then they went down there simply for Wright's health. It wasn't that Wright was, wanted to go to Phoenix necessarily, but if you had respiratory issues, and by the 1930s, that would have been his seventh decade, uh, probably his fifth practicing architecture. And he had trouble with bronchitis kind of creeping up in the moist kind of fall environment and springs of, of um, spring green. So the doctor said, well, I'll do like a lot of Americans do. They either choose Florida or they choose uh, the desert. The desert's better for your passageway. So he went down to Scottsdale, found some inexpensive desert land outside of Scottsdale. And today we'll draw within the background uh, Camelback Mountain, which is kind of the, the backbone and the spine of the whole culture down there because the camp kind of nestles into the four sort of foothills of uh, Camp McDonald. So we'll look at that in the sketch we do. But before we get there, I just wanted to mention a couple of things about, uh, I gave you that sequence of events now the last couple of weeks are gonna play out. I posted a spot for us to showcase your artwork. So it's going to be in the uh, first, floor corridor north heading out to the, the site they're demolishing across the street from us at the architecture building and um there's two sides because there's another thing posted down there too we're using two sides of the hallway so basically when you come to either side uh when you've got your package of two 11 by 17 sheets and i'll explain those in a second on the wall there should be enough space for you to simply show both of your panels side by side. So uh, you'll post those. I'll have a name for you in the lower right corner for those in case you don't actually put your name on the artwork itself. And so I want what I want you to do, the UWM students, because you're in-house, I'm asking you to actually um, do that and print your own. So you can do it at your leisure there rather than me trying to collapse them. So if you want to submit them earlier, go ahead and do that. We'll just, we'll just create this like a little spring garden and have the houses kind of grow on the, on the site themselves. So we're looking for what you did initially there for the exterior. So you've got uh, the floor plan at a certain aspect and then two exterior views. And it's gonna be like that. You just make sure you get the largest amount of images for that principal floor plan to scale and maybe you choose three sixteenths or sixteenth or an eighth, but something so it's relative so people understand the scale of it. And obviously your perspectives aren't in scale, but one's from the straight view and one's from the backyard view to show the best indoor outdoor spaces. So this is like you submitted before, but this is your last iteration of that towards the last 30 points for the house project. And then what will really sort of sell it for your peers who look at your artwork is what we've done twice now. And so your finally third kick of the can there is the great interior. And that will be your final presentation there. Again, if you've done it in color, go ahead and print in color because I can't access that anymore on campus. And I'd rather have you do whatever original art you want to show. It doesn't have to be in color, but right was of color in his interior. So if you do that, we'd love to see that too. And then we'll just march along and fill up the wall as high as it can go. And then probably I've got push pins for you already on the wall to take you down about kind of uh, knee height. We don't want any kind of artwork down by the floor. And once this big wall fills up, there's another small panel across the hallway from it. And the, the course is labeled in the lower right, so you know exactly where to pin up. And those, I really have to start grading those uh, right when you start your final, that last, that middle week in May. So right around the 10th or 12th, make sure you get your artwork on the wall there so I can start working on those before our finals are over the following week. Um, and if people still want to have things reviewed, just uh, send them to me, your, your most uh, current iteration, or try to catch me when I'm at my office hours, Tuesdays or Thursdays. 
but probably just digitally back and forth as quick as I can print and get the information back to you. Uh, a lot of people are on their way, don't need much attention anymore. Other people might want to see another uh, sort of feedback on their work to date. So that's what's happening there. Uh, I'll update. There might be a couple minor changes and ticks in terms of dates and times for the booklet. But right now, just stay to that one email I sent so far, unless I adjust it later on. Okay, the other thing before we get to Tally S and West, just to show some of the things that are happening at the same time. And I know I'm I'm a little bugged about these final eight that UNESCO chose. I understand Tally S and West because it was more of a social condition for rights ideas, but it really isn't a master work in itself for me compared to other things I would have put on the list for it. But I see they made the pitch when Tally S and asked for this. You have to actually put your name up and be nominated by several groups that they thought one Taliesin can't go without the other. And obviously Taliesin East is the mothership of everything. So that makes a ton of sense to be on the list. And so Taliesin West is on the list because it's also part of Wright's actual social life as a home and studio. So it's almost like they got a double hit for the sake of it being another Taliesin. Uh, obviously an, an, an interesting exchange for that would have been Johnson Wax. That's why I brought that. Cause it's from this, this decade of master works because he did Jacob's one, he did Johnson Wax, he did Falling Water, he did Tally S and West, all in that same decade when he's approaching his early 70s. So pretty miraculous. But uh, Johnson Wax is really spectacular. And again, it's the company itself that said, please don't put us on the list. We'd prefer to remain private. Whereas the other ones are much more kind of, even though it's touristed, they just didn't like that activity of having the whole world now try to visit their place. Because it is, you know, a working billion dollar company that's global. Just check under your sink and you probably have five or six of their products that are helping pay for their facility here. But what's remarkable about it is it's stage two of what he did back in the first decade of his prairie career when he did the Larkin building in Buffalo, which you read about in the portfolio. You saw images in the booklet. Uh, I think we did a, a quick sketch of the form of it. But it's the same type of principle now in sort of a more streamlined age of when the Art Deco is starting to inform his work too. So it's the brick skin does the same thing where it creates this externalized poor vision out from the workplace and sort of internalized massing inside of it so that it would force people to be in a well-lit office environment, but sort of inside the hall of a very religious space. So when you see the forms of it, uh, you can sort of see a hint of it in this model if I tilt this right. You see the cruciform planters. Those are each of those sort of mushroom style columns that spring up from the floor. And the mass of the sculpture of the structure is actually above the actual workers below it. And it comes down to a point load on the floor. So it's almost like walking a very orthographic projection of a forest when you go inside that space. And as some of you know, you've been sending your, your site slides have already visited. This is a great, easy, free visit. They love to have people come through there. They do it on a real um, kind of militaristic type of, you have to be on point, no touching anything, no photographs, march you through, and they leave you time in Racine enough then to have, if you do this at the 10 or 11 in the morning, go have lunch in Racine and then check out their other site, Wingspread, which is the original home for the man who generated this, um, Mr. J Mr. Uh, Johnson himself, Herbert Johnson. Um, which is now a conference center. So you can do the two in the same day. They're both free. Used to be they wouldn't do, allow you to tour both now on different on, on the same day, but now you can. So book that some weekend or if you've got a long afternoon and try to see both sites at once if you can. And so if people had seen that, you'll also go up in the research tower, which is really cool. Uh, kind of odd, they didn't pay attention to code back then, but they had to shut it down pretty quick after its initial usage because it was research in terms of chemicals. And chemicals can be explosive. And the trouble with this is that even though it has natural light in, it really doesn't have operable windows for escape. And so there was only one way out through a spiral stair, which is against obviously code today. So they shut it down to all activity and all we can access now with tours are small groups of, I think in, in sets of 10 or 20 is the capacity. And they, they only allow you to go up a couple of flights now where it remains safe, even though it's not an active research center, it's just an unsafe building in case some fire broke out, there's only one means of egress. So it still stands as a, as a sort of a masterpiece of elegant design because it's the same kind of idea of dendroform columns, but now they're stacked. So each one is a floor that's cantilevered out 
So it's just ribbons of glass that go all the way around it. So there's no obstruction if you wanted to have peer view. Because it was a workspace, it doesn't have that type of glazing. It's got tubular glass. So it lets light in, but doesn't give you a clear view. This part of Racine wasn't really a great, beautiful place to look at. It was very industrial and polluted back then. So the whole complex is very internalized for that point. Okay, so uh, that's that's what I would say is a great sort of aspect that would flip that around. That's important for us to think about what we'd shift if we could take two away, which I would argue would be Hollyhock and Talius and West. Now that you're becoming sort of quasi right scholars yourself, what would you suggest would be a great substitute for the things you know about right? Maybe things you've visited or things you've read or seen on the internet that seem like they're really hierarchically more important than Charlie S. and West or the earlier Hollyhock we did. It might even be a, a sample question for our final exam later on to have you really sort of defend your idea of what you'd substitute in terms of switching around the final eight of UNESCO sites. So from the 30s, again, a great composition there. It's even got the uh, out in its parking lot out front. You kind of meet out on the outside um, terrain for this. It's got a Rydian, um auditorium that was done for the New York's World's Fair. They got shipped out to New York and kind of constructed there. And at the end of the fair, they brought it back, repurposed it for an auditorium here for the guests to talk about Johnson Wax and Frank Lloyd Wright before you enter the actual site itself. There's also a lovely Norman Foster building for the new um, sort of worker center, cafeteria research area that's just off campus. Norman Foster is a great uh, contemporary British architect, very high tech, very respective and moved his principal building loosely based off a of light rights language, kind of off the view of the main axis here. Excuse me, it would be off this way. Okay, and then what? a couple other things before we get to the sketch. Uh, I know a lot of people are working in um, the Usonian condition and you're, you're not really in, in, inside the language. Nobody really adopted any time in the circular pattern. In the initial sketch we did way back in February, we talked about those seven ages of right moving finally to the circular phase. So at this point in his career in the late 30s into the 40s, he took a really great sort of essay on housing and said, can I do the pattern language of a growth of, har of harmonies using the Fibonacci series. So if you stacked every circle in this plan type for the Jester House, this is actually the pool side idea on a little slant hill. So it's tucked into a hill and the outside is a body of water, the biggest circle. As you put those all in the same, same center point, there's a growth number of how they're growing um, geometrically in their progression from the smallest to the largest, the pool side here. And then the whole thing can be also be inscribed in a circle too as one larger circle. And so he took those pieces out and then put the this function of the building within that harmonic growth of how you go from the smallest circle to the largest and then splayed them out into the plan type so it worked functionally. Then he tried it with squares. Then he tried it with equilateral triangles. Those two never got built. This one did by Mr. Jester. So even at that point, he was really still striding and trying to make their, their architecture perform along the language of the harmonies from nature herself. And then speaking with one student today, for those who are do, going stronger and deeper in zeros and ones in the digital age with um, defining their plan type into perspective. So you've got a file there. I would encourage you just to convert that file, no matter where your basis is, if it's SketchUp or other types of programs, um, convert the base thing into an STL. So whatever you finalize yourself in, there's always some type of quick download app that'll flip it over to stereolithography. And then you can simply, as well as turn in your perspective, you can just simply print your model. So for four or five dollars of product downstairs in the RP lab or at Madison, if you go to the engineering RP lab there, they can print a version of your model just in simple form. Don't go too crazy with details, just for massing that shows it very, very correct to your actual then projections in three dimensions. So that's one more added step. If you want some extra credit for that, that's fine. But I kind of like to look at students work when they take it one step further, if they've got a little bit of initiative to see that final piece there. And so this is kind of a lovely way to finalize your project. Keep one for yourself. Send one for me. If you're in the building, we'll, we'll build a little uh, 
metal sheet that comes off the wall perpendicular. So you can rest your model in front of your renderings if you go that, that far there. So consider that because it is kind of the wave of the future when you draw for the client and then you wanna explain things further, it's good to show up at the meeting with an RP model too. So this is something from uh, last spring that a student kind of wanted to do a model of their scope. And obviously they chose you Sony as well. Okay, so on we go now. Let's start with um, the, a little bit of the site in terms of what's visible in the vertical plane. And that's this back line here. And so the foreground for our sketch is going to be Wright's water play, then the subject of Taliesin West between the drafting studio and his residence, and then up to this vertical frontage here of the small kind of hill or mountain range in the distance of the desert. And that's where it's kind of cropping up to that size then. And then to anchor this down, we'll, we'll work with, um, excuse me for a second. Sorry, we got a visitor and the dog a little berserk there. So uh, we'll start with our, our main massive masonry piece, which is the center that kind of has all the planes spiraling around that. And we'll simply drop that down with its thrust back to the earth there. And then from there, there are planes in space, which are going to be an array of how he works at Taliesin East. I know a couple of you visited that before um, even this class started. You've been there to understand that. So Wright has a really close proximity between where he sleeps, where he dines, and where he drafts. And so just adjacent to that, as more and more of the firm came down and settled, over on this aspect is the drafting studio, which then terminates into another mass of verticality over here. And so this is a, a pitched roof that comes in kind of as the crenellated, crusty rock type of triangulated shape of the desert. So if the jester house is him developing nature through her circles, certainly at Taliesin West, as opposed to Taliesin East, he works with triangular formation and angular configurations of the desert in Arizona. So these planes that are gonna project out, so he gets to the top wing of the residential area over here, and that flies off with the flat plane of architecture was sort of the natural outcry of architecture behind it by nature. And then as it kind of comes out to the Western sunset, which has got a lovely kind of view then over into parts of Scottsdale and then down in the valley more towards Phoenix as well, as this is a little bit more on a mesa that overlooks it a little bit. He's got a projecting eave that comes from that central part and then rushes out to points one after another to have horizontal beams that rush out and like fingers kind of project out to that valley down below. Now, as it settles down, as, as these planes kind of carve out the temporary space, because a lot of this wasn't even glazed in when we first built here, because it's such a dry, arid, predictable climate year round. And back then, I don't think it got to the typical 110s, 120s now. Climate change has really made it devastating in the summer now for this part of the United States. But rising out of the desert, he wanted to do something that was man-made that was also of a desert quality. So a good way to see that is when we draw the support for this, he made the walls, just like in Taliesin, he made it out of the river rock that he could quarry along the river edge. Here he does the same thing, he takes desert rock and he puts it into an architectural formwork that isn't quite orthogonal, it actually is sort of the truncated version of the lower part of the pyramid is if it's growing out of the earth like stones grow out on an angular quality. So if we do that with two strong lines here, this one gets lost, it gets tucked on the interior, but the top of it goes back parallel to it. And this one will again vanish back to the same vanishing point we're doing there. You see this rush and power looks like a very huge girth of one singular stone. And yet when you come closer to it, you'll see it was done in three pores. So there are three lines that project back and then wrap around this way on the front as well to the other vanishing point. So what Wright does, and it's kind of an innovation of a building technique that Wright 
thought about how to do this cheaply, because again, he's just an architectural practice and he's building this campus for a multitude of people to live in both campuses twice a year. So he sets up a wood frame uh, uh, carcass, and then in it, he'll drop in rocks and boulders from the desert, as well as the liquid concrete. And then what happens is when you pull this away after it all sets, you can then start to clean it up quickly for it completely sets, and you start to see profiles and activities of the facing of the rocks, kind of irregular, and the rest infill by the concrete itself. And then that would be enough for the pour for the day because it's a time issue too when you're doing concrete. And so we'd stack that from one day to the next. So we'll come back to this detail, but that's sort of like the plinth or the base, not unlike Taliesin East, but a different system because at Taliesin East, the river rock is stacked vertically on top of each other. This you're getting the face of the stone is just sort of poured in the irregular quality because the, the way the, the stone is quarried in the middle states is different than what you find in the desert because these are sort of just boulders that are jumbled up. So it, it kind of makes a cohesive singular architectural vision by using the desert as this, as this decoration. Now, what he wants to be a little bit more um, correct in terms of architecture and the presence of how people move in, move in the space, for instance, he's got a piece out here, which is also the base of a pyramid, but it's his access in and out of this big sort of cruciform middle piece that anchors all the planes coming out of it. And that's the, the truncated base of a pyramidal stair. So that's poured concrete because we can't use the scale. There might be some of the smaller pieces, little flecks of stone inside of it. Basically, it looks like a monolithic plinth. So we can simply come at the base of this and drive these points home in perspective to that right vanishing point in the front here and drop that down. There's probably more trends that I'm doing that now, but all of our sketches are inherently a little bit more of a cartoon piece anyway. Uh, and then it turns the corner and comes around the other way to the left vanishing point, because in this case, it is square in plan, the base of that. And it comes in and butts into the side wall. So this is a little bit higher pitch than these coming down on this side. So this rises up to a certain point to this height. In front then, he's got sort of a slope celebratory piece of a massive rock they don't want to showcase as the art. He doesn't import secondary art, he uses the art of the desert. So he'll pour another piece like this to support it and then end it about midway through that top deck. So again, we've got sort of truncated edges to it and then the facing stones that kind of form the texture, the color changes, it's rich, it's hues of red and orange and yellows in the stone. And on top of that, he sits, the top face of that we can barely see here from our view shed, he's got the actual monster piece boulder that sets on that to kind of say this is about the desert. And then the stone at the base wraps around to this point and then starts to integrate to the more modern space of having a utilitarian drafting studio, which moves from this point is a bar that comes out off our sketch over here with the rhythm of large timber members. And so for those of you who looked at the photos inside Talies and East drafting studio, the real architectural scene is how he spans the space. So in this case, instead of having um, the, the pure diagonals meshing with verticals, he's got diagonals that come out and return as diagonals coming down and then back in, up, back up. So it's the same type of magnificent truss work, but it's even more diagonal in terms of its presence in the building. So there's a thickness on the outside. We come to the next truss here and the next one, but then there's a little shed of glazing that comes out as if there's a, an observatory room right at the edge here, which is squared off. So these are the pieces you want to draw on later to show the movement of the structure that's always really present when somebody's drafting below it inside the room. And the stone wall continues around the corner here and just moves its way kind of off of our vision. So we'll kind of have the sketch die off over here. And on this point, we do get to the edge of Wright's actual um, personal residence. And so we'll come to that edge and then kind of infill some of the desert when we meet the horizon line. Okay, if you play in the foreground now, this is where he, he 
extends the idea of a plateau of water because if it's beastly hot, just the sound of water is cooling. So he always has jets and fountains moving in the heats of the, of the, the moments it would be there. If he went October, usually it's Octo mid-October, he would go and come back the first thaw. He'd get back to the Midwest. So this is the Midwest was Habitable, who, who was back on campus. In recent years, let's say the last 30 years since his passing, 30 or 40 years, I think the whole thing turned more from being three months in Phoenix to be nine months in Phoenix and maybe three, four or five months in spring green. So it would, it would kind of twist it around in terms of what the dominant campus was. And quite frankly, when you're in Scottsdale, the idea of being in an urban area and having a place for your kids to go to school or to be around other people, this is much more of a, a habitable space year round or predictable than being in spring green. So I could see where they're making that choice over the years. But Wright always preferred to get back to Wisconsin as soon as possible. Got for the second deck, he's got a little bit of um, deck space that's outside on the second floor here. And so there are little bastions of structure that open up the windows there and march all the way down the facade. So we'll see the underside of the structure going back these panels. And so they've got deep inset because he's always concerned about not having light striding directly on the glass there. So whenever he can, he sets the glazing actually deep in so it's covered for those people to stay there more year round. And even when he had his full firm and school working, there'd be people that would be year rounders at Talies and West. And now it's probably the more dominant in terms of tourism, in terms of numbers and administration, their archive for drones we just sent down from Talies are down here as well. And just because it's near Phoenix, it has a better flow of people in and out of the building trying to see right works. Okay, uh, around the side, then we get to the more private side. It kicks out to the basin of the, of the Camelback um, Hills in the, in the distance there, the uh, McDonald Pride there. So we'll see a little bit of the roofing come down from the initial rafters up above and stagger over here and then float. And that floating comes back along our horizon line and kind of meets the end of the stone we initially did. And then we'll see the base of his rock wall going out that direction and then some hedges that kind of soothe that place in front in terms of a green view, and that kind of trails out then to the desert. So the hill will start to rise up here as you leave that part of it. So what we'll really see in the distance is really just sort of a, an array of casement windows and plates of glass, which show the living room looking out over that great setting sun for the rest of the, the valley down below. So in the foreground, just to kind of do this, this is an actual uh, performed triangle. And so it's gonna match the stair edge. That's gonna rush off with the base being parallel to the rest of the space. And then here's a 90 degree corner to it. So it's a square at that end. Now this one is uh, angular compared to those two. It it's completes the triangle. So it's not going to vanish to our two horizon lines. And it's got its same kind of stone edge, which we'll see wrap around all three sides of it. And this one leading to a short stair that comes up a little bit of the half wall. And then there's an opening in the middle of this big bastion over here. So some stairs lead up to access, showing the thickness of that wall. So that'll be a dark area we'll kind of enhance later. So it's a really kind of lovely environment because um, just like Atelier and West, it's so removed from the immediate surroundings of urbanity, like Atelier and is far enough away from Madison or the small towns around it, you really feel like you're out in uh, a significant environment that's special for some reason. And the same is true here. It's, it's even though Scottsdale is kind of a sprawling suburb type of city, there's enough land purchased by right to protect this, and they've sold off some to survive over the century but it's still is sort of insulated. You have to drive a bit from the roads of Scottsdale to kind of come to the campus sort of more out in the desert here. Um, but if you see an aerial view of this from the thirties when they photographed the property after Wright's first encampment, it looks like it's out in the middle of nowhere. There's no sense of any town around it. So what we'll do now, because we got all the component parts, we'll just sort of layer in some of the initial tones of value to kind of set things up. So one of our first will, just to give a wash to the hillside in the back.
And then we'll treat the sky too later on to make sure we get the depth of that desert sky above that pitch there. And then the desert's gonna come around. And since it comes down and, and so the, the floor of the desert kind of meets the hill, it's one continuous piece. We'll kind of keep that all continuous for now. There's a little bit of the, the tree line that's sort of out and around the building. I'm not sure if that's original or something or right and planted over time, but that does show on this edge and immediately will make that a darker value for us, right at the crown of this roof there. But there's nothing else that large in scale. There might be some cacti behind here. Behind this whole campus, this is sort of the, the public frontage of it. Parked cars over here, the, the archives over on one side, the auditorium, uh, the place where they'd have, you know, conferences with their architects and clients. And there's some admin buildings. And then the students would either live on some, if they're older, in some of the housing that's still adjacent to this, but then a lot of them would simply build projects to live in out in the desert proper in Wright's territory. So they'd have little mock-ups from their sort of quote unquote studio work, which is simply working for the firm. And then in their spare time, they would build out their, their legacy pavilions out in the desert. And so we'll take this as a setting sun. So what we can do is project a shadow line from the projecting roof here so that we know that's gonna be a cast shadow and we'll leave the rest of the stone fairly bright for now. So we'll have it stamp in there. And then the front wall here won't receive light there and it will cast a shadow on the stairs. So now we build that corner up. And what our goal is here is to show some really transfer of light, shade, and shadow. So even at the point here, this doesn't receive light because it's perpendicular to it. So that edge of the pool getting down to the water is much darker than the edge just over here, which receives light. Same is true for all the treads of the stairs. The treads that we don't see will be much darker than the ones that are being washed in light over here. So there'll be a little bit of ribbon of light for the actual tread, but I'm drawing the shadow on the face of each step moving down. And a little bit thicker as you make it to the base. And that'll help that pyramidal thing work a little bit there. As we turn this corner there, it receives lights bouncing around, but this part of the stone is much broader and, and brighter to it because it's direct sunlight. So around the corner, we'll know from the stone on over, this part of that whole wall shape is not receiving direct light. So that can be a gray, and that helps us turn that corner there. And like all the sketches we've done in class and how I encourage you in your rendering of your, of your home uh, it, itself, the identity of it, let's come down here a little bit further, is that we're always trying to make the white next to the dark here where the sun hits. We want, we want to eventually leave your drawing so that this is a brighter white than the page white you started with, even though it, it is the exact same piece of paper, we can make it appear like there's actually a light factor. So that's one of the goals in your projection there. So the same thing here happens up this side. This side of the stone doesn't receive light. This side of the stone doesn't receive light. And that'll come to the front piece of this glazing, which comes all the way over and then wraps around that corner so it's darker here. And now because this is glazing, um, the whole wall behind it is darker because it's an interior, but it's also reflective of some of the other dark things it sees outside of it. So this la last panel over here is so far under this, this top detail, which runs out front here, is all very dark because that's actually behind the stone wall. And then that'll come up to this first piece of projected beam that comes out. And it'll be a darker tone up until it gets to the face where it's white. And the one adjacent to it is even darker yet because that's deeper inside the space. The one there we see a little bit beneath here and that's even darker yet. So we get a little bit blacker and blacker as these beams go in the past. And now this one against its background is the darkest of them all to get that movement of structure go down the space here, because if the gray's around it, you have to move in black or next to it to have that projection out there. Now, right space is crenellated with glazing all the way through that. So in a sense, we're gonna go through into the glass skin and then out right way to the vegetation beyond it. So we have to come to this corner and now come back to that horizon line 
with the sense of an interior wall on the other side of that. So it goes down to the edge of the glass and returns here. And our horizon line is such that it's right over that space. So we see a little bit of the roof line coming back here. So that now we're inside the space. So those get very dark, top and bottom, to show we went inside that. And now we're gonna show a little bit of the valley come through there at the base. So we've come into a little bit of glass area. So we say we're outside that and it's receiving light, but we're gonna go right through the glazing and out glazing around that corner back out the building. So you know, it's sort of a square inch and a half here. We've done a lot of modeling of space in the distance. Uh, this would normally, because it is a stone wall there, be very brilliant, but I mentioned that they've got some vegetation adjacent to it. So there is a view of some greenery out here, which is rare in the desert, obviously, to see greenery. So that'll be a darker tone right in front of it. But it'll be darker at the base because it's casting a shadow beneath it. And then on the other side of it, where it does hit that wall, it'll be very dark adjacent to that. And there's the rest of that front wall we talked about. Okay, there is a grass lawn here in front of that. So that whole plane compared to the water will be darker. So we can have a walkway come from the other side, but basically the most of this area out here is a glass, excuse me, grass esplanade. And that'll lead up to the stone walkway that goes around the water and the edge here. And now, you know, water is tricky because it's not really a color, sometimes because the, the skin of the pool beneath it might be painted to blue to make it look more like water. In this case, it has a little tone to it, but really is going to make it water most is that it has quality of reflection. So mostly all water always reflects straight down. So if this was a straight line, we draw that straight down, but it reflects the cant of this. So we can come down here and do that same distance off of this cant being opposite coming that way. And then because it's true to perspective, when we come to that height of that piece right about here, that will also vanish to the same vanishing point we started with. So that's parallel to the top of the reflection going back. And now this line over here would also see it can't go back. And so that little bit there, this kind of helps it look like, oh, we're talking about water now, not just some other paging material. And then we can come in and say, well, there's, there's some movement of the air moving across there to make some ripple effect in the water. And so we can add that to say, it's not the same as the stone. But whatever we draw here, we'll show some samples of, for instance, if there's a dark stone there, we'll do a little bit of it. Probably you, you make it more gray than dark adjacent to that as you come here. And then it kind of dissipate out. You simply don't want to repeat the same language there because the reflection is never like a mirror. It's always a little bit different. So you want to modulate it back and forth. So that's our start with the water, sort of claiming that. Um, we still have some value over on this side of this stone wall because it does a 90 degree turn. And the stairs come over here. We can we can kind of tease those out now as they kind of go up and behind here to that top length. We'll step them down so we have a nice crisp edge to each step going down against that wall. And now all the uh, wood members that come up here and they're kind of laminated pieces of flat architecture. So you've got a, a, a smaller piece adhered to a larger piece. And by the time you're done, they collectively work almost in a triangular way to use less timber than you would a single member to have cheaper pieces kind of drawn together. So they come up to the top, they meet the top beam up here, and you see a little bit of the depth of each one beneath the skin of the roof. So it's prominent there. It's got a little bit of that desert language of not being orthogonal. And yet sometimes it will pop out with an orthogonal piece. So what happens here, is the actual glazing on these sections that have got these wood trusses. I'm gonna give them a zone because the, the roof skin is white and that's good to reflect all the heat in the summer. But those come down and give a relationship down to stone, which is really brilliant there. So we can draw a little bit of, again, because it's kind of closer to us, some of the stone. Again, it's not a subject, so it's a kind of a cartoon version of it. It's got a little concrete deck. And then this part is also um, sort of a, a different color walkway. It's not water, but it's got a, a system of being a darker tone, which is nice. Because then we've got a tone that sets up the movement of lights of the building. 
that'll help that base. Now this box we're gonna deal with because it's outside of this top here, the rest is very angular. Now he's got these cubus things that pop out from it. And it's very, very minimal. It's, it's not a very heavy architecture that holds this space up. So there is a rhythm of verticals that come down through this that support this space. But as I mentioned, they're, because they're glazing, they're gonna reflect this line of dark that's projecting out here is actually gonna go back into this space as kind of a line item. So when this comes out and projects, this is going back in the distance all the way to the, about this point. And so that's how that reads as being glass, as being something that's reflecting outside of that. It still is a little bit darker tone. It's not as bright as the stone, but we wanna make it work as glazing. And so we're gonna use the effect that it has kind of a mirrored image to it. So this is gonna reflect this line coming over too. And then structure on that side and that angle will turn. So at the base of this point, these guys come down there and there. And so from the tip of the roof's eave down is all glazing for the studio. It's canted back, so it's protected by the, the inclination there. And so this whole value across this skin is a darker tone to show that it's an interior space with the white space up above. So again, a lot of planes that are kind of, they're not hard architecture, it's very sort of lightweight. Uh, in the initial stuff, the only thing you can afford because the other was a really temporary camp, were actually canvas ceilings. So draping of sort of like a cloth fabric that would simply keep the glare of the sun on because it really never projected much rain ever while they were there in the winter months. So uh, obviously things are changed now in terms of the need for air conditioning. So it's a more sophisticated architecture now, but initially it was much more like an encampment. Now I'll go up top and pull out some of the recesses in here because the canopies up top here, again, are protecting those skins on the inside by having a plane of white above that. But eventually we do get to the interior. So we'll come along the top there and show the depth of looking into those and then periodically you'll see the structure for those and then reflection of those rooms with the white that you see from the sun and the horizon. So we see a little bit of depth in there, the side wooden kind of um, lookout area up top is, is, is sort of dust red in terms of the tone. So it'll have a tone to it, but it'll be deeper and deeper on the shade side. So we've kind of established all of our principal tones now, and now we just spend the last little bit just kind of highlighting some details and pushing more information to that actual scene here. So one of the things we can do to make this waterway sit down, we want it to be bright where this is bright, but coming back up this way, and if this is the, the stair doing the opposite, the stair then would read like this and then come to its top the same distance away and have that and that little piece would come down. So that's a darker tone. So we could simply say that's going to reflect difference than just the sky here. And as it pushes this corner, a smaller area, we could probably make that darker and then simply have it fade to white. And that pops out the, the movement of this pathway between the water and the grass area here. And then stone again, and the stone wall in the interior. So again, it's always layers of ideas that are kind of articulated here as you me me meander more through this site than you would at Talies and East in terms of that language. So we'll come back and make these front pieces a little bit deeper for us. And then we'll see a little bit on the back plane as you turn around there. Maybe just make sure that edge is pretty prominent as the house steps away and points in the desert there. Okay, so now we're gonna wash just left to right and move from just to sort of page white to the light forces of gray to heavier and heavier. And we'll start by just saying, what are the lines that are showing us a real projection of space beyond them? What is significant in terms of holding volume? So again, the rule is in any type of box, the ones that are closest to you is important because it changes planes, but it's not a heavy line itself. It's done through value. This one line by itself is very important because you can actually perceive yourself going around this edge or around there, and there's space beyond that. 
there's no space beyond this line because it's on the surface. This is still on the surface, but it's holding volume behind it. So these lines are more dominant now. And we'll draw those a little bit more like the angular quality of the stone in the pore that made those. Just like we'll come back and do that to show it isn't like a pure straight edge and the tops of the walls is a little bit mixture of concrete and the stone edge. So it gives that character of having some quality of texture to it. The pores themselves have got a little gap and a reveal to it. So we can show that between the pore levels. And then we can probably treat the bright part of the stair too with the movement of the treads stepping down toward the base there. And this will receive less light than this side of it, which goes to about this point. And we'll, you know, when there's a subject matter, we'll kind of pick out some stones, be a little bit darker than others. But again, don't get lost in detail there because uh, it's not about, if you like this, sketch that. This is just a little version of it on, on top of your sketch, so to speak. Let's move up the top there. I think we can go inside this room now and show some activity of what's happening in the space beyond here. And that's really kind of accomplished simply by showing, once you get past the edges of the structure here moving up, is varying what happens behind the skin of the glass as if there's some activity, but it's just very generic. So you can create kind of planes and tones that it more animate the space beyond that. Because if you treat it all the same, it just seems like a stronger piece of glazing. In this case though, it seems like there might be movement beyond that glass. And so at the top here, it might show the reflection of the projected roof, marching across there. And then here, this comes back in projection, but above that, in the distance, there might be something actually in the space we see as well next to the structure. And that'll help kind of show it's reflective glass, but it's also quasi transparent too. It's difficult because it's mixing the form with the material itself and the transparency of it. I think we should come to the tops of all the trusses, these sort of wedged sandwich types of trusses that march along the roof line. And make sure that ed edge is very appropriate. And then, of course, the top of that, where it meets the sky and or the mountains behind, is a very strong line as well. And this is also one of those stone concrete pours, so we're regulating a little bit, but be careful about the top edges there is really performing for you here. And then this will return at that point. And then maybe because you want to have a disparity between the tone of the mountain range in the back, we'll come to this edge and deepen it up right where it comes and touches that quadrant there. And have this one come up and deepen next to that point. Deepen and a lot of grade eight down to a gray here. I think we have enough particulars and the value that pops into these little zones of the lighting for the second floor up there. And then that edge against the desert. And now the things that are closest to us are going to be even bolder. So we really want to make this one front flying member of structure. Very prosaic out to the front here to its edge. And then it's got a support piece for the rooms that come back so we can make it deeper and darker here. And then have it trail out to be the lightest of them and have the neighboring ones that go back a little bit denser as they make their way. And then we'll start to work on a little bit of value to pull some of the neighboring movement of the building the spaces into us here. So we'd see this line come down to the horizon line over on this point. And after that, just a little bit of the value to make that stand out. The depths of that. And now, again, we give a scale of this. I think it's kind of indicative by the stair itself that indicates human scale. But just as a reference, we could put somebody, oh, we won't make them front and center, but we'll put them maybe at the edge of the glass looking out. Just to get the sense of the human being and the scale there.
articulation for the base of the trees here, which would be darker than they would be. And that make it just a two dimensional mass. And then we can do a little bit of throw because right now the, the range behind it looks like just a, a flat piece of paper so that we can move this part of the mountain coming down in front of it and this part of the range coming down in front of that, which makes this part slip behind it and potentially see less light slip behind it. So now it seems like pieces of bigger portions of nature that are uh, next to and adjacent and join each other. And of course, there's the the inherent um, natural aspects that are growing on the mountain, just like there are in the desert. So we can go back in and do some diagramming for like the little desert type of bushes, which will soften the edges of the original line work here and give some texture to it. Because it's not just rock outcropping, it's also desert greens that are out there, creating little pockets of light, shade, and shadow. And that's probably better closest just to its profile rather than the whole form itself. And I'm sure this is why Wright chose this site. Not only was it his budget, but it also had some very beautiful aspects that are part of his, again, as we've seen, the way he talked about the idea of a, of a God being out there was through Mother Nature. So he starts his religion with a capital N. So we'll come back in and do a little bit of detail with some of the stones here that are closer to us. Uh, we'll take them back and just dissipate that in the wall because once you start it, the viewer will keep that idea cognizant and just move the concept all the way back, even though you don't draw it. They understand the whole thing's a stone wall. Maybe turn the corner. There's an excuse to come back in over here and say, once you walk in here, it's deeper and darker toward the base there because light's getting in through it. So it'll keep that open. And then the side that we see might receive less light there. Um, shadow cast, and now that darkness goes under here as well the whole way. And we see a little bit of projection back here up towards Wright's living area. I think we've done enough in the back in the distance there. Let me give an edge to the grass over here, give the edge to the grass over there to give us thickness to it. So grass isn't like an actual millimeter, it's sort of a four inch carpet. You want to sort of overdraw the thickness of it because it actually is an important plane here that's used. In fact, it, between the water and the grass, it's cooling the building as the breezes kind of come through at dusk every day. So there's a line here that connects that out. And, the, and really the sun kind of bleaches out detail and you see more detail sometimes in the shade side because there's less of a contrast. So we could pull a little bit over here maybe. But going too far now with too much detail, we'll turn this into an imbalanced uh, rendering. So if we just kind of keep it as a sketch study, it's out of the eight things we're drawing, it's the less sort of conscious single building that's got this idea to it. It's more about the essence of the lifestyle of right in the desert than a real memorable single building. It's got lovely features that all seem very proto writian and all the language of it, but it's not like, you know, uh, iconic, like you'd say, this was iconic, or certainly the Jester House along the way. It has those singular view sheds to them. The Roby House is singular. The view of, of falling water over the waterfall is a singular powerful impact. Where this is more of like um, an accretive experiential type of place. I don't like Taliesin East as well because you took away the bird walk. There's there's one, there's no real one view that sort of speaks about the whole campus up there either, which makes both of these fairly unique. And obviously that's intentional by how Wright wanted to portray his practice as well as his home life. So that gets us through to next week where let me pull up the subject for you really quick <clears throat> where while still in the 30s right is um in a sort of rising as a phoenix from the desert here and being rediscovered after the depression 
he gets this bounty of clients that are and takes incredible clients to do incredible buildings. So he's got um, Johnson and Johnson Wax, and he's got um, the people who own the department store in Pittsburgh, Edgar Kaufman, who then commissions Falling Water. And so we've seen the Pew House before, which is sort of an earlier or kindred spirit kind of in Wisconsin on, um, on Madison's campus on the Northern Lake. Um, I don't remember what the current owner's profession is, but I think it was commissioned for a doctor who's named Pew. And so it sits over here, terraced over the river. And so that sort of three-dimensional ideas of planes and space is also the same language of what we'll sketch next at Falling Water, which obviously you already know that it is a building not on looking at the waterfall, but it's perched on the waterfall proper. So the uh, tributary to the major river comes by this property over here. And Mr. Kaufman always thought he would build across the stream. So you look at it from the living room, right put the home directly on top of it. So actually there's a plunge pool directly into the river on one end of it. And you see in this little RP model where the water drops at the base of the building. And so that's probably the biggest international spectacle of an individual building outside of Roby House that Wright accomplished. But they're coming one after another here in the 30s, where you think he would have hit his stride in the prairie period, and that would have been enough for one career. But now he's got Usonia and these major commercial works that are also being built in this decade. So a real spectacle there. So we'll try all falling water here in the same media that Wright sketched it in the mythical way that apparently the story goes that um, Kaufman came to see the progress that Wright was doing, and Wright. I guess didn't start working on it yet. So Wright spent the three hours it took for Kaufman to get his transport connection. He was in Chicago where he said, I'm coming up to Spring Green, which would have been you know, about a three or four hour trip. And in that case, Wright was be able to kick out the floor plan and a sketch similar to this to say, yeah, we're done with the scheme already. But in Wright's imagination, a lot of people would think that Wright sometimes wouldn't draw until it was already figured out in terms of his imagination. And he could hold that image and then simply draft it out later. Could be myth, but that's one of the stories I'm sure you read about in your biography in terms of when the two met up there. So that'll be next week. In the meantime, enjoy finishing your homes there, wrapping up your work in the book. Again, if you want to get some of this out of the way, I'll have your name tags up there probably by Thursday morning. So we'll have room for everybody. Obviously, the Madison people, when you're done with your files, just send them to me. Again, I want to make it really important that every image you send has to be 300 DPI. So don't scan your artwork or download it from your software, just assuming it's the right quality. Make sure you've got at least 300 DPI. That's for printing and for me to do it in later book work or to teach with the stuff and show other students that's the highest quality we need. 600 is overkill because you're never going to make a bigger image of it. But if it's a smaller image, I might want to double the size of it. And you can do that with 300 DPI. And then in terms of moving files quickest for me and having the least amount of need to go into Photoshop all the time is just send them by JPEGs. So if you can make the effort there, it saves me a lot of time because we have so many different homes in this class here. 300 DPI and JPEGs is the rule. Not pings, certainly not HEICs from your phone. Those are really hard to deal with. Uh, they don't need to be PDFs. Just nice, clean things like that. And then, um, again, if you want color, please print in color. And the Madison people, mail them to me, and I'll post them for you. But if you don't want to print in color, just give them to me in black and white, and I'll print for you here. UWM students, you're on your own. you got to print for yourself this time around, because I won't be drawing in your artwork. I'll just be grading it the next time around. So I know you got a lot to do this next month. Hopefully, you can just gauge all this and feed it in the right. So I'll keep, keep the lectures done for now and we'll just move through the last couple of big things falling water followed by Guggenheim and then it's just packaging from there on out so I can take questions for those who are interested other than that I'll see you next week And I've also got about six students now have sent me their slides of being on site somewhere. So if you've been somewhere, just send me those now so I can register those in. Or you can wait till the final exam and submit them then too. But that's kind of the deadline for looking at these sites, I think. Uh, they're all so close to you now. You guys are so spoiled as architecture and engineers and landscape and urban planning students to be this close to so many of his works.
it's it's a uh, it's a great bevy of treasures out there for you guys. Any questions? What um what format is the final exam in? Like short answer, multiple choice. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit of everything because I need you to uh, sketch out some answers. I need you to draw diagrams as you write your essay. I need you to do vocabulary or key individuals. Uh, dates, not so much. It's more about the periods of the dates, you know, the 30s, uh, what happened, you know, before, after the Great Depression, you know, like, you know, mm -hmm. where World War II fits in and how that affected his career, like, things like that. So it's not about you know, details of history. It's about the big kind of swatches of ideas. And I think the fair way to do that is you'll write a little bit, you'll draw a little bit, you'll match names simply. And that way I get a good comprehensive idea of, yes, they've run their bio, read their bio, they read the book, they did their drawings. Now they understand they're much closer to Wright's language than they were before they took the class. Okay, so this is something we'll probably then be printing out and like scanning. Right, so the process there is fairly simple. I, pre I prepare it and see, I can't do this on canvas or something because uh, there's no control at the other end. And because I want it to be graphic, it can't be just like uh, a digital thing. You're gonna right. have to draw into the test. So it'll be a, a file that's sitting there in your email, like the, the morning of, and the email will say, do not open this file because as soon as you open it, your exam starts. Oh, okay. okay. So don't, when you get it from me, I'm going to tell you a preemptive, I mean, saying the next email is your final exam. Do not open the next email. You have to do the one, I the first one to read this. The second one starts your test because there's a timestamp whenever you click through on an email. So I know when you started. Okay. Then you've got time allotment, the 90 minutes to take the test, scan it and send it back to me. Then I have the second timestamp. I know exactly everybody had the same amount of time to take the test. Right. Okay. So your key is to either be near a scanner and a printer, or when you're done, you can use your phone and you can use cam scanner on that and send it back that way to me. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Thank you. Yep. I just have a quick question. Did you say Thursday, this Thursday or next Thursday for additional drawings? Um, I'll be there Thursday. Uh, I'm sorry. And, uh, again, I'm, I'm I'll be in the in my office on Thursday, but you don't have to wait for the, the office hours. You can just send them whenever you want. Okay. I might not get I might not get to them exactly when you send them to me. It might may take me a day or two, because I'd rather collect a couple in a row and kind of do them all at once than kind of you know every third day get a project. So I'll let them pile up a little bit. Then I'll get them all reviewed and get them back to you all at once. There. Um, gotcha. Okay. And again, I think um, half the class really on their way. They know exactly what they're doing. They just need to sort of do another iteration, tighten things up, strengthen things. Uh, and others can, you know, you can problem solve by yourself now. But if you want more hand over hand stuff, we can do that too. Or again, face to face, if you're in Milwaukee, come by 295 on Tuesdays or Thursdays. It seems like the schedule now is, because I always do something else as soon as I get there in the RP lab or something. I'm definitely in the room by noon, but I have to get out of there by about 120. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right, thank you. Yeah, you bet.